All right, so in the first part of this lecture series on the history of genetics, uh, we talked about domestication and how domestication really was the root, uh, uh, the, the base for genetics because it, it did two things. One, it opened up these observations, these human observations that we, we could look around and say, well, that's an interesting plant. That's an interesting form of that animal. I want more of them or less of them. And, and uh, we started thinking about how we could do that. And what we left off with was the domestication also gave us the opportunity to pull ourselves away from being pure hunter-gatherers. We didn't have to chase around constantly for food. We had more availability of food. We had more time to think about things and to work out uh, various developments. Technologies came along. We used the one example of irrigation, but we had construction methods. We had shipbuilding. We had all sorts of things that came about because we really had time to think, astronomy and other things. The sciences started to develop. Well, with the sitting around and, and, and seeing that we could change plants and animals, the questions came about about, well, how can we do that? You know, what, what, what's working? What's making this work? Right? So what developed from this were some theories about how all this goes on. In other words, how genetics works, at least the heredity part of genetics. So in this little part of the lecture, I want to talk a little bit about some of these base theories uh, and where they came from and, and the little history of them so we can understand, okay? So let's go back to our timeline that we used, right? Uh, we said humans go back uh, at least 100,000 years as Homo sapiens, probably maybe up into 300,000 years now. Uh, our timeline then would wrap around this whole structure, whatever room you're in, wrap it around several times. But we're going to go back about 10, 12, 15,000 years before present, because this is really when we have pretty decent ev evidence of domestication. We have real evidence that people were thinking through some of these theories and that they were pre-existing. So let's just go back. Uh, that's plenty of time to work back. Okay. So what's the first theory? What's the first idea that about where things come from? Well, it uh, turns out that it's one you well know is spontaneous generation, right? The basic idea that things just occur. They just come from form. Now, in reality, what we're talking about is things go from one form to another. That was the basic idea. It turned out to be the final idea for things like uh, alchemy, right? We could take a base metal, and if we messed with it, somehow we could turn it into gold or something else, right? So this whole idea of, tr of transmigration, uh, of movement of things, all was under spontaneous generation. Okay? So it's the basic idea that... that uh, living structures can, can just occur. They can occur from other living structures and move. Um, the example of why in the world would anybody think that? Well, I mean, think about it. You're, you're, you're sitting here. This is a long house. Very commonly, uh, before they developed things like uh, chimneys, it was uh, common to have a long house, well, even after that. But chimneys were pretty important. Actually, kind of odd that you have a fireplace uh, because in these buildings, smoke would just kind of fill up so everybody was downstairs the animals and everything else, once you develop the ability to move fire out of the smoke out effectively through a chimney, you could layer off the building and you could end up with people, the, the, the kind of the landlords living upstairs and the servants and animals living downstairs. It became the class system. But anyway, we're in a long house <laughs> and uh, we've got this long house. Uh, one end's got animals, other end's got the people and their living conditions, kind of a common area in the middle. It's the way they work. Okay. Somebody slaughters a goat or something else. Uh, they get all the meat off of it they want. They, they, they're going to use the bone for something else, so they throw it over in the corner, and it's sitting there for a while. And so here's this piece of bone from a mammal, you know, something they're using. Uh, you go back a few, you know, a few days later, and they start looking at it, and they realize there are these worms crawling around on it. So somehow the, the, the meat or something on this bone has converted itself to a worm. And if you wait around another couple of weeks, uh, suddenly those worms start to turn into flies. So somehow you've moved from this, this thing was walking around with horns and producing milk and all that, this, this sheep or goat, and now you've got flies, right? And you've gone through this movement of somehow being worms in the middle of all that. So it's pretty obvious that you could think about, well, it must be able to go from one form to another, right? We must think. So this was really the thought of it. Now, in, in the broader sense, we started writing about and thinking about spontaneous generation. Really, we almost always invoked some deity, right? There was a spark, right? And people would pray to deities for, for things and things, so they, they, they would come along, okay? Uh, we have pretty good evidence for that. There's things like this uh, Venus of Wiffendorf, which is at least uh, 20,000 years old. 
these clay models that are pretty common. There probably were wooden ones produced even earlier than this. Uh, clearly, this is a pregnant woman, and it was a, a deity that you would pray to or, or to ask for blessings for to, to you not know, have children. So there was some idea that there was this deity involved, and once that deity was happy, you were, you were allowed to, to have, sort of have these children, right? Um, and this whole idea of spontaneous generation, believe it or not, carried on until uh, 1800s, uh, certainly into the 1800s. Um, and it really wasn't final scientific uh, breakdown of this, of, of refuting of this idea, until the famous Pasteur experiments uh, that occurred late in the 1800s. What did <laughs> do? I mean, it, it, we didn't have it. We were still thinking about it. In fact, if you go back and look at any of this, uh, look at Aristotle's book, talks about spontaneous generation. Uh, if you look at some of the religious tomes that are still around today, you know, that we very, very important in the world today, uh, various different religions. Uh, this one happens to come from the uh, Genesis, book of Genesis, but we talk about the these waters and things. We talk about staffs being you know, put into the ground and the staffs growing into various things at various places in the books. And even some of our great writers, you know, I'm, I love to go to Shakespearean plays and things. And they talk about how mud of the of the Nile transformed into various things. So some earthen type of things. And that certainly fits with this whole, you know, Mother Earth idea, these Swiffeldorf uh, Venuses and those sorts of things. But again, back to Pasteur. So what Pasteur said, I don't know about this. So what he did a simple experiment, right? He just took some broth and media and water and other things, various ways. He developed a way to have uh, prevent air from flowing into them. Once you stopped up the air, ended up that you didn't get new life. So you couldn't just take this one product and it changed into a fly. If you left it open, of course, you would get, you'd see that you grew mold and bacteria and things might even, uh, you know, you might have mosquitoes leaving larvae in it or whatever. Uh, but if you closed it from the air, it would stay sealed. And it was a, a very strong proof that it, there was no spontaneous generation. In fact, some of his, his things are still sterile to this day. They're still sealed. They're still sitting there, which is kind of amazing. Now, I, I say explicit to the late 1800s. There were lots of other theories that had come along by then. There weren't that many people that believed that it just magically appeared. You know, you didn't just magically get pregnant. Uh, there was a, there was involvement. But you can also think about it, though. I mean, if you think about um, ancestral humans were out, um, the act of reproduction w occurs nine months before the birth, right? Uh, in many, some species of mammals, it's years, right? In elephants and things, but in human, even in humans. So there, the collective, there's no collective direct relationship there. You go along, you have this reproductive event. Uh, nothing happens, appears to happen for quite a while. Eventually, female starts to develop into a you know, reproductive uh, mode. So you start to see that there's a baby bump, if we call it today. Uh, and eventually, there's a parturition, a birth. But that's months and months away. So there's real no connection there you know, at first between these, these sorts of things. So all that fit together and, and kind of fit into these theories. All right, but if spontaneous generation is not right, what else did we have? <clears throat> well, we had a couple of important things here. Okay? The Greeks had sat down, and they had thought about it, and they're saying, yeah. And they had d dissected humans and done all sorts of things. So they said, well, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, and they came up with some pretty cool ideas. One is that form and function fit together. Okay? We're going to actually go back to that. When we start talking about the way proteins work, the way a protein works is based on its function, is based on its form, is based on how the amino acids put together to make it the shape that it is. Well, they felt the same way about reproduction and those sorts of things. And they had lots of other things that they threw in. Okay? They believed that the male provided the form. That's going to be important in a moment. Okay? And the female was sort of the incubator. Right? We still have colloquial sayings like that, like it's a bun in the oven, right? A bun in the oven is some idea that this female is housing this, and developing the structure, uh, but it goes back to the idea that males actually provided the, the form themselves, okay? Uh, blood's always been important. Uh, in fact, on the, on the Venuses, if you, when they looked at them, around the crevices of many of these, there's this red material. People thought it was okra. They thought it was this red pigment from soils. But it turns out it's not. It's actually blood. It's probably menstrual blood. Because there was some obviously confusion about menstrual menstruation of humans and, and reproductive times, and they would rub it onto this 
hoping that somehow that would uh, generate a pregnancy and form. And then some fun things like right and left theory. Um, the Greeks had this idea, and it still persists in some societies today, that uh, after the reproductive event, after intercourse, if female lays on one side, uh, you'll have, because they knew humans were bilaterally symmetrical, right? They had dissected lots of animals and humans and knew we had right kidney, left kidney, right ovary, left ovary, and all that. So if you laid on one side, you would have a better chance of having a female daughter or a daughter. And if you laid on the other side, you're more likely to have a male child, a son, right? So right and left theory, still, there's still some belief out there in, in various societies that that exists. All right, so spontaneous generation, though, and, and the Greeks are even thinking about it. This this idea that males provided the form led to this this sort of theory of ready called preformationism. Basically, that there was uh, most of the human was there. We were transmitting physical pieces of ourselves to the next generation. Okay, um, and people that really brought this forward uh, were William Harvey back in the 1650s. And his basic idea was that uh, animals come from eggs, right? But those, those eggs are actually housing these these parts, these 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 whole organisms, right? And sure enough, um, when when the microscope was discovered some years later, okay, not very far along, a major advance in technology, uh, and little hooks, little microscope, they started looking at things. Well, what do you look at? You look at you know upside down e like you do in general biology, uh, in a plant, you know, piece of something off a plant, and a little dandruff or whatever you have around, uh, and eventually you get kind of looking. What else you got? Well, if you're a male, pretty easy to get sperm. So they looked at sperm and thought they started seeing vessels and things in sperm. Right? Uh, there was clearly, and it fit exactly with the Greek, you know, philosophy of what was going on. And in fact, all the way to to a, a few years later, there was a whole description of this. Somebody took a microscope, looked down, and said, "Wow! Not only is there parts, there's a whole little human in sperm, and that fit perfectly with this Greek idea, you know. And these humanocles were, or the idea, drawn up as as being there. Thanks. And then actually, there was. Uh, right after that, there was quite a fight, uh, scientific fight, because this person named Malphigian uh, believed, going back to the eggs were the important things, believed that he saw these structures in eggs and not in sperm. And they were actually battling back and forth for several years about whether it was the sperm or the egg that actually carried the little little protohuman. And <clears throat> it changed, of course. What happens in most science, what, what advances our science a lot in any cases, is things like technology. Well, microscopes got better. We started looking at sperm and egg again, and there are no little humans there. There are no little legs or feet or vessels or anything else. So clearly, uh, this preformationism had a short blippy time. It was there. It, it linked directly back to the, you know, the Enlightenment, to the new discovery and re-evaluation uh, of the Greek writings. It seemed to fit in, but technology said, no, it's not really the way it works. So what else do we have? Well, about the same time, taking these same ideas, well, if they're no whole little humans, maybe they're human body parts, right? And, and that ended up affecting this person, Charles Darwin, who we'll talk about quite a bit. Charles Darwin's in the, in the 1850s. Uh, he's trying to put fi finalize his book, his great book, Tome on Natural Selection. <clears throat> and he needs a theory of heredity. It's critical for natural selection will only work if you can pass the traits down from one generation to the next. And so he needed a way for that to work. And so he was thinking about this. And the best he could come up with was taking some collective ideas that already existed and kind of putting them together and formalizing it in, in, to this idea known as pangenesis. Okay? So this is the sec this is the third, sorry, I guess in the sense, uh, theory of heredity. The first was spontaneous generation, and there was this blip of preformationism, and now we've got this pangenesis idea. And Darwin was heavily involved in this idea, even though he didn't like it. In fact, uh, once he published Origin of Species in, in 1859, he spent the rest of his career uh, breeding and trying to do things to figure out uh, a, a good theory, right? Uh, unfortunately, he didn't know that Mendel existed at the time, and, and he could have, well, actually did. He had it in his library, but he didn't understand it, uh, apparently. Uh, but he spent the rest of his time trying to figure it out. Now, pangenesis, what was that? Well, it just goes back to the Greeks, right? Okay, if you don't have a whole body, but you've got blood flowing around, and you can carry pieces from one part to the other, and that's really what it talked about. It's the basic idea that that 
cells, body parts would float through primarily the blood system and end up collecting in the reproductive system. That explained lots of things. It explained uh, things like uh, maturation to puberty, right? Because we don't, uh, for many organisms, we don't just pop out and, and reproductively active, uh, at least not in mammals and, and things. Uh, in fact, primates have a fairly long period before we're reproductively active, but even anything has, you know, uh, mammals have months or maybe years before they're there. So this gave time for all of that to collect. And you've all heard the phrase, oh, he got his mom's nose or his dad's ear. And they literally meant you got your dad's nose or a piece of ear that developed into this. Okay. So, and these pieces were called gemules or pan genes, in some cases. And they literally meant that they were either cells or something that's kind of moved through from your parts and, and floated around. Okay. <clears throat> this is the best they could do. Now, kind of worked. But it had a couple of major issues. And in fact, Darwin didn't really like it after all. You know, he sat there and went, surely that's not the best thing we can come up with. I, I, it just has a problem. Now, the reason he really didn't like it was this. <clears throat> it fit together with two basic ideas, um, and one of which is going to be really important to us. We talk about Mendel, which is known as blending, blending inheritance. It was the idea that... Um, Mom and dad, when you put them together, you got this hybrid. Remember that little picture that I had uh, on, the, on the introductory lecture where I had dad with a striped shirt going one way and mom with another, and then the child's walking by them with the, with the bl perfect blend, the, the kind of overlaps? Well, that was the idea, right? <clears throat> well, that's a problem for Darwin, okay? Because if, how are you ever going to get a big thing if you got little things out there? Because every time you get mutate or get changed to get a big thing, they can only mate with little things and they keep coming back to this average, to this middle. So, so it's blending kept pulling the things back. Okay. It kept making this average. And that's not the way that natural selection was going to work. Okay. So this was really kind of in direct opposition to things. So this is the first problem. Okay. Now it's interesting that the, the whole idea, though, did lead to some co pretty cool statistics stuff. Uh, many of you have had statistics may know about regression, this idea we plot X and Y, or X and Y, and we points and we put a regression line through it, a line of best fit, maybe linear, curvilinear, or whatever. Well, the word regression itself comes from regressing to the mean, regressing to the average. And it was it was people that were mathematicians in the 1800s after Darwin published his work. They were trying to figure out uh how this inheritance worked that actually developed this concept of, of regression that we still use today in these statistics course very important models okay all right so that's the first thing what's the second thing well pangenesis is is much better uh related to things called acquired characteristics right this idea that you can gain stuff from your environment uh, one of the major proponents of this was was uh, Lamarck, and it's called Lamarckian theory, Lamarckianism. And it's basically the idea that you gain stuff from the environment that you pass on, right? Um, and that you, you have these structures. And where does this come from? Well, I mean, he's wandering around um, in his carriage somewhere in France, and a horse throws a shoe, loses a shoe, and they have to stop at the smithy, the blacksmith. Blacksmith's under a tree. He's hammering away on this metal, making a new shoe. He's got this large arm for he's been hammering. Here's his son standing there pumping the bellows, you know, doing this. And he's got these large arms. Well, obviously, Dad acquired them by doing the work, passed them on to the son. And we still see this. You know, we think that people who have great athletic skills, their children are naturally going to have those same athletic skills. Uh, we think that people that have artistic skills, their children are naturally going to have that. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, okay? It, it's not because you went out and practiced throwing a baseball all day long for five years that your son or daughter is going to be able to throw a baseball uh, any better than anybody else. That's, that's not the way it works. But that, under Lamarckian theory, that's how it would work, okay? <clears throat> kind of the, the big way of thinking about this is those giraffes that were there. Under Lamarckian theory, uh, you got all these things, these herbivores out in the plains of Africa. They're eating, and they're, they're all kind of making a browse line, as it's called. Everything's eaten up to a certain point. Well, the things that could reach a little higher to get a little more food, and they would stretch their necks. The pan genes from those stretches would eventually end up in the reproductive organs, and they could make a longer neck. So giraffes got long necks by stretching their necks, right? Darwin, of course, said, no, no. What happened was you got these mutations. I think they had long necks and they could eat more so they could produce more offspring. That would be the Darwinian ideas of how this worked. Okay? 
Uh, but it went on, right? And it went on until uh, the late 1800s as well. Okay? And there were two big experiments that sort of disproved this whole idea of Lamarckian theory. Okay? Weissman did one of those. Um, one of them involved taking rabbits, uh, taking white rabbits and black rabbits, and taking the ovaries out and transplanting them into the others. Uh, as young rabbits and then waiting around to see when they reproduced if the white rabbits with the black ovaries produced you know, white rabbits now because it had acquired and they didn't of course they had the eggs were already there in mammals they're already there when you're born and so a white rabbit with black ovaries would produce black based you know uh, little ones little rabbits so <clears throat> it, it didn't it showed that didn't work but Weisman's experiment was was one of those classics okay uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do this one today, probably animal welfare would get after us heavily, but they said, okay, let's just take something and mess with it, right? Use and abuse it, that's what it was known, right? So I said, okay, if it changes, do this. Let's take, let's take this rat, let's chop off his tail, okay? Well, let's mate it with another rat with a chopped off his tail. Let's mate those and mate those and mate those offspring and offspring and offspring for multiple generations. Uh, and see what happens. And they did this for 32 generations. Okay, so we're talking about years of work here to do this. Uh, even though rats, um, you know, breed fairly quickly, it still took a while to do it. Well, guess what? After 32 generations, right? More, far more generations than humans have been around, in, in, you know, certainly in, the, in the United, this part of the world. Many generations, right? What, what happened? Did they get short tails? Absolutely not. They came up with absolutely normal tails. So it was a classic experiment that said, no, even if you do something dramatic like this, they, they, you know, it doesn't work. Okay? It's not the ideas that exist. Right? So that's where we are. We've got these so far. Uh, we've gone from domestication to giving us this time to think. We've come up with spontaneous generation. We've had this little technology blip that gave us preformationism, which fit perfectly well with the, the, the ideas the Greeks had put down. When that didn't work, we said, okay, it's not a whole little humans, but it's little body parts. So we called that pangenesis. And then we basically said, uh, I don't think pangenesis is going to work. The basic ideas underneath it don't work. The theories that fit don't work. And even Darwin, who, who was trying to, to work with it, said, nah, I just didn't seem it to work. So what was left? Well, that's part three. That's the lecture that we'll now go to and talk about in part three.